Hello, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is October 8th, 2023, although you're probably not going to see this till at least October 9th, as I have one more short to share in this uh, short and shareable series. So the last three shorts I've put out have been connected to how the harvests of the earth play out in giving us the prophetic timing of pre-trib and mid-trib, as well as the one that will be coming out uh, on Monday in the early afternoon, which will be about the grapes. So there's been three connecting the wheat for pre-trib, mid-trib, and the third one was about how it's revealed in Scripture, uh, to touch on a quick story of it. And then tomorrow, early afternoon, will be the one about grapes, and this one, of course, will be the one to sum them all up with Scripture, to show it, support, back it all, not only with Scripture, but with literal events that take place on the earth. So we see them right here. The, the wheat harvest connected to pre-trib, the other wheat harvest connected to mid-trib, and then the this one here, uh, which came out on Sunday tonight, uh, today, and it shows how both of them play in the pre and mid and uh, a little glimpse of how they're connected in Scripture. So that's what we're going to talk about today, how the harvests of the earth give us a prophetic picture of the end of days. And this is going to be in what I call our shareable series. So unfortunately, there's no shorts like, you know, we've got shorts here. There's not a section called shareables where they're shorter videos than the long teachings. But that's what these are. This is what I've called them. Uh, so they'll be just long enough to get the understanding, get the revelation, be able to track it and follow it, go dig into it for yourselves, pray over it, and easily share it with others without having, you know, some of my two, three hour type videos that are really in-depth teachings. All right. So with that, for anybody that's new, you're going to hear things that are going to really twist your brain like a 14 year tribulation. And you're going to think this guy's nuts. No, I promise you 100% with all of my heart, the scriptures have revealed the end of days are 14 years. But before you get to that understanding, you need to understand the revelation that began it all, and that is who the Gospels are speaking to. You're going to realize that the synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke in the end of days are Luke, Mark, and Matthew. Luke is speaking to the pre-trib bride of Christ. Mark is speaking to the mid-trib great multitude rapture in the seventh year of seals. And Matthew is spoken to the post-trib uh, return of the Lord feet down on the Mount of Olives. It's all true. It is pre, mid, and post. All of it is true. And you can come to this playlist, come to the playlist link. And in this revealed end time study series, uh, study note series, there are 12 videos in there, but just focus on the first four to really begin to understand the revelation of this and, and understanding that it, the reason why we haven't understood it. The other place you can come to watch these videos as well is on ministryrevealed.com. You can come over here in the menu box, click on intro. That's the page I'm on right now. And this is the same one. So this is a 22-minute introduction to the rest of this intro series, the three videos that follow. This one is who the Gospels are speaking to. This is going to reveal to you the understanding of who Luke, Mark, and Matthew are speaking to that many people have argued and, and, and gone back and forth over, over centuries to say, why are there contradictions within the Gospels? You know, Muslims will come against it and say, see, it's written by men. Even some atheists that would have read Scripture will tell you, see, it's written by men. Look at all the contradictions. Well, we reveal to you here that all of those contradictions are not contradictions. They're prophecy. It's all prophecy. And when you understand who they're speaking to, you're going to realize that it's 14 years, seven years of seals, and seven years of trumpets. And when you come to this one, those other two are about 30-minute Bible studies, and this one is two hours and 45 minutes to help you understand that the real story of how this was all missed is it's, excuse me, it's all because of Matthew. And what that means is for centuries, we have been taught from the gospel of Matthew in, 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 in seeing everything from Matthew's eyes, unbeknownst to everybody starting from Matthew, 
they only look to Mark and Luke to get little added nuggets. They don't really spend the time to see what these differences are really telling us. And when you understand those first couple of videos that I shared with you up here, when you get to this, it is going to blow your mind. So I like to start everybody there always. You can go from YouTube or you can go from the website. And if you want it to download, you can watch on the website. Or if you want it to save the videos for yourself and share them, it's literally a one-click download to your any device that you're watching from. All right? So with that, let's get started. This is always a great place for me to start with a lot of these teachings because a lot of new people will come across this and they think that it's just, at first, it sounds like it's so crazy. It just doesn't make sense. Well, I promise you, the scriptures told us exactly what to do. And we read it right here in Ecclesiastes 1.9, that the thing that has been, that means that's a picture of like Old Testament from in the beginning to the birth of Christ. The thing that has been, uh, uh, the thing, sorry, the thing that has been is that which shall be, meaning there's still prophetic insight in the Old Testament for the is to come. And that which is done, which is from Christ until the moment of the pre-trib escape, is that which shall be done. There is no new thing under the sun. Nothing new. You're going to find clues in the Old Testament. You're going to find clues in the New Testament that give us prophetic insight both in the is to come. And we're even confirmed this in Isaiah 28 when he says, even starting in verse 9, Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. This is all in conjunction with what Ecclesiastes 1.9 said. You're going to find prophetic insight in what these are called, which you'll hear from different teachers or, or pastors even that do talk on prophecy, is it's called typology. And when it comes to typology, there are very few pastors that ever delve into it because it's not something they're ever really taught. You have to seek out the scriptures for yourself, search it out to receive the understanding, pray over it, and do the same with this. Pray over it. Ask the Lord to reveal these things to you and go and search them out for yourself. Do you realize we're rewarded for diligently seeking the Lord, right? You want to be like Enoch was and pre-trib and be like Enoch in Christ, spirit-filled. Well, you first have to have faith. You have to believe that he is God and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That's what we've done. And so we're going to go into this with the harvest and show what these differences are in the harvest. And the main harvests that that are revealed in scripture that are that have prophetic insight in the end the most clear ones are the wheat and the grapes but it has been so twisted in the teachings for so many centuries that so much has been missed and i would say that there might even be things that even if there are some pastors and so forth that may be understood and have come to understand some of it because they have boards, because they've got committees, because they're part of a larger organization, they can't change. They don't want to stir the pot. And so everybody's left having to search these things out for themselves. Okay, And that's what we've been doing for the last six years here. The, the spirit has been leading in just revelation after revelation and after revelation. And so this is what we're talking about and what we've been talking about in the last uh, three shorts, uh, before the next one, that'll be tomorrow, like I said, tomorrow, early afternoon, uh, which will be about the grapes. And then this will come out later, which covers it all. But in the last few shorts, we've been talking about the difference between winter wheat and spring wheat. And this is something that so many people have missed. There are two wheat harvests. There are two. Okay, you have to remember the barley was bread that was baked without leaven. Without leaven. So there is no without leaven humans. Okay, it was only Christ. 
So, so what is this prophetic picture that we're trying to understand in the timing of the wheat harvests and of the grape? Who do they apply to? How do they apply? And how do they show us a picture? And where can we prove it in scripture? Okay. Well, listen to this right here. Spring wheat is sown in the spring and is harvested in the fall. Okay. This is all in the Northern Hemisphere, just like Jerusalem, all right? Israel. Winter wheat is sown in the fall lives through winter and is harvested in the summer. This is something that is called Kadosh and Yoshon. Okay? And what that means is Kadosh is is wheat that is planted after and takes root after Passover, which means it is spring wheat. Okay? Kadosh is wheat that is planted in the spring. It grows throughout the summer, and in the fall, it is harvested. But when it's harvested, it is forbidden, okay? For the Jews, kadosh grain is forbidden until the following year. And that period of time is the following year on the second day of Passover. This is really important to understand, and you're going to see why if you're newer or if you have just tuned in and haven't been or either haven't seen the shorts or haven't fully understood them. The other one is called Yoshon. So winter wheat is Yoshon, and the reason it's Yoshon is it is planted in the fall. So late, late fall, it's planted. It, it starts to grow and take root before, through winter. And before Passover, and then it grows through summer and is harvested mid midish summer. And when it's harvested, it is called Yoshon, which means it is usable right away. There is no forbidding to wait before using it. It is immediately usable, which means they can grind it right away. They can bake bread. They can do all sorts of things with it right away. Whereas spring wheat, which is called kadosh when it's done, cannot be used. Even though it is harvested in the fall, it cannot be used till the second day of Passover. And these are things very important to understand the difference between spring wheat planted in the spring, harvested in the fall, and winter wheat that is sown in the fall lives through winter and is harvested in summer. This is very important to understand the distinction. And their differences reveal pre-trib and mid-trib timing in the prophetic is to come. It's absolutely incredible to see. So let me show you one of these things. Part of these differences it's when it comes to the Feast of Weeks. We have, as you know, seven Sabbaths to be complete. From the seven Sabbaths, even on tomorrow, from the seven Sabbaths, uh, da -da -da, from the seven Sabbaths, shall you number 50 days. Now, the whole world of church tells us that the Feast of Weeks, that the Jews call the Feast of Weeks, the Christians have called Pentecost. It is absolutely not true, and we could prove it by what? The harvests. We can prove it by literal harvests. We can understand more accurately when and where these Sabbaths begin to get counted. And what this adding of 50 days comes after the seven Sabbaths. This is something we've shared in a recent short as well. And, and what we see is, for example, when you go to Passover, Passover will tell you on the 14th day of the first month, on the 15th day of the first month, okay? When you get to Feast of Weeks, when it says, then shall you number 50 days, why doesn't it say, Seven Sabbaths, then shall be the 50th day. Passover said 14th day, right? 
15th day for unleavened bread. It even goes to the first day of the seventh month for trumpets. It tells you for atonement, it's the 10th day. Tabernacles tells you it's the, uh, where is it? It's the 15th day. You see, if the Feast of Weeks was supposed to be the 50th day after seven Sabbaths, it would have said, it would have said 50th, but it didn't. It said, then shall you number, then shall you mark off, then shall you score 50 days. And this is very, very important to understand. And we even see it throughout the New Testament. Let me give you uh, a quick little side glimpse into this. In 1 Corinthians 15, this was a, a great prophetic insight right here. In, in verse 15 through 8. And on the third day when Jesus rose, he met with Caiaphas, then of the twelve. After that, he met with over 500 brethren at once, some that are asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen also of me, one born out of due time. We've all been told that there were 12 apostles and just a bunch of disciples. No, there were 12 for the heads of the tribes, and there were 12 apostles. And then there was obviously a bunch of disciples. Hello. You see, what, what does this reveal? Well, this isn't the story of, this isn't the topic of today's uh, subject. But what you come to understand is he met with one group. Then he met with another group, which is like seven times seven Sabbaths. Right? Then he met with the apostles. And when he met with the apostles in John chapter 20, what did that begin? That began a 50-day uh, um, count that went from the meeting the apostles. Then he met with Luke's group, some disciples. It goes into Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2, the end of 50 days with the, with the uh, Holy Ghost anointing at Pentecost. These, these are real intricate little details to understand. But it's so important because it's directly connected to numbering 50 days after. In fact, when we go to another place here, let me go into Deuteronomy 16. And let me show you what Deuteronomy 16 tells us about the Feast of Weeks. Seven weeks shall thou number unto thee. Begin to number seven weeks from such time as you begin to put the sickle to the corn. Well, you'll see, I'm going to show you, there was no corn in Israel in ancient days. Okay, it's only been about 500 or so years. So it's stalks of grain. So they'll tell you it was barley. But was it barley or was it wheat? You see, barley was connected to Jesus and that sheaf that was brought in while it was still green ears. But when it comes to wheat, it doesn't get brought in at the beginning of the wheat harvest. It's brought in at the end because what did they do for the Feast of Weeks? Well, in Leviticus 23, it tells us there's bread baked with leaven, right? Feast of Weeks. You're to bring what? Two loaves with leaven that are the first fruits, okay? Two wave loaves of two tenth deals shaken uh, and bacon with leaven. They are the first fruits unto the Lord. It's not the same first fruits as the one for, for um, Feast of First Fruits. That's the one without leaven. This one's the one with leaven. So there was bread brought to the Lord baked with leaven at this festival, at this feast, which is at the end of seven Sabbaths. Then there's a numbering of 50 days that goes to Pentecost. You see, you only see the 50 days added. You see, it didn't say then the 50th day. It didn't even say then shall you number the 50th day. It said then shall you number 50 days. So not only didn't it say 50th as if it was just one more day, it didn't even say day. It said plural days. And again, we're going to prove this with the feasts, I mean, with the harvests. And what you just saw in Deuteronomy 16, there was no addition of 50 days. 
It was simply seven Sabbaths. These are very important things to distinguish between to understand. So what else do we see in the difference between spring wheat and winter wheat outside of their timing? Well, when you go in, dig into the difference between spring wheat and winter wheat, you find out that spring wheat compared to winter wheat, winter wheat is usable right away, whereas spring wheat is forbidden until the following year on the second day of Passover. But there's something else about this, and that is that winter wheat, the usable wheat right away that is called Yashon, that is usable when it's harvested and can be baked into bread with, with leaven is called old wheat. Now, don't get confused and think that old wheat means it's old and it's rotten. That's not the case at all. It is simply another term for it. It is called old wheat or old grain. Here it is right here. Okay, This grain is called Yashon literally meaning old grain, okay? Whereas the grain that is called Kadosh is called literally new grain. So that's what it means. Kadosh means new grain. Yoshon means old grain. And this is so vitally important into understanding why understanding spring wheat and winter wheat and their connection to their harvest times and how they prophetically tell us the timing of pre-trib and mid-trib are so important. Let me show you this story right here. In Genesis chapter 29, check this out. In Genesis chapter 29, you guys all know the story of Jacob with Leah and Rachel. Okay? We find out that Jacob sees Rachel and he wants to marry Rachel right away. And so he makes a, a deal with Laban, his to-be father-in-law, and says, I'm going to work seven years for Rachel, thy younger daughter. And he doesn't really say anything. You know, he lets them think he's going to. And so in Genesis 29, 20, Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed unto him but a few days. He was so in love with her. Those seven years flew by so quickly. And he ends up what? He goes into his goes to his father-in-law, his to be father-in-law, says, Give me my wife. My days are fulfilled that I may go in unto her. Laban gathers together all the men of the place and he makes a feast. And then he finds out in the morning that. He didn't have Rachel, but that he had just been with and married Leah. So he's all upset. He tells his father-in-law, you've beguiled me. And what does his father-in-law Laban now tell him in, in verse 26? And Laban said, it must not be so done in our country. Listen to this. To give the younger before the firstborn. What is this saying? You cannot have the new or younger one before the firstborn or older one. You see, they're sisters, right? They're sisters. One is older, one is younger. He's got, what did he end up getting? He got the old winter wheat before the new spring wheat. Hello. It's the exact story of winter wheat compared to Kadosh new wheat. Spring wheat, winter wheat is the old grain called the older one or the firstborn before you can have the younger new one. It is a picture of the wheat harvest. And what ends up happening? He gets uh, he gets Leah, right? So we know now he's got Leah. He's got to now 
fulfill the week, right? The the her one week wedding. This is the Gentile bride wedding. That's the picture of Leah. And what does he have to do? Then he has to serve seven more years before he can officially get Rachel. Hello. You starting to see the picture here? If we go to Genesis 31, you're going to see a very interesting story that plays out. You see, it says in Genesis 31, 41, thus, thus have I been 20 years in thy house. I serve thee 14 years. Now, some people get confused. When I talk about this revelation of 14 years, this is not the 14 years I'm talking about. The first seven in this 14 is what we call the, the bride waking up, the spirit working, this period we're in right now. They're the first seven of the 20 years that I believe are coming to an end next year. And I'll even touch on that towards the end of this. The second seven years in this are the seven years of seals where he's essentially working for Rachel, okay? So it says, 20 years I've been with you, seven easy years that flew by, they seemed like days. That's the pre-trib Luke group. Then seven more years for Rachel. And then what does it say? Six more years for your cattle. We find out that he was 20 years with them in total. And when the 20 years were over, he made a covenant with his father-in-law. Okay, 20 years. And he makes a covenant with his father-in-law. Seven easy, flew by like days because he was so excited. That's the pre-trip. When that picture of those seven easy years for Leah are done, the older wheat, feast of weeks, of the true feast of weeks count, as I'm going to show you, is taken out of the world. She is the pre-trib Gentile picture of the bride of Christ, who is the winter wheat, old wheat, firstborn before the younger, that goes before seals begins. That's the picture. Okay? Now watch this. We see that in Genesis 20, uh, 31, there was 20 years, and we're going to get back to this in a moment. And when those 20 years were done, then he makes a covenant with his father-in-law. I want you to remember that. We're going to touch on it in a, in, a, in a few minutes as well. So now you've seen he worked seven years, flew by like days. Okay, let me show you a, a picture on our chart. This is a chart we call our chapters to years. If you're new, don't worry about it yet. But what you see is Luke. Okay, Luke is a picture of Leah. There's your seven easy years. And then there's 50 days in a period called above. The bride will leave right at the start, right before this 50 days begins. And then it's 50 days to Pentecost. When that 50th day is over, the seven years that he has to serve for Rachel begin. Then he works six more years for the cattle for a picture of 20 years which means at the end of this 20 or in the end of day's picture, because these were the easy years in this picture, when these 13 years are done or in the bigger picture, including the first seven easy, when those 20 years or 13 year picture is done, the Lord is returning like on this dividing line right here at the end of 20 or at the end of 13 of tribulation. And he's going to fulfill this final 14th or 21st year which is the year he makes, he's going to renew the covenant that he made. Okay? I don't want to go too far down this rabbit trail for you, except that I'm going to touch on it, and I want you to understand this picture. Seven easy for Leah, seven more for Rachel, six for the cattle. When this 20 years is done, it's the equivalent of this, of seven years of seals, six years of trumpets. The Lord returns feet down on the Mount of Olives and fulfills that final year in what's called the day of the Lord and the year of his vengeance. All right. So as you can see what's taking place here, let's keep going. 
when now is this winter wheat harvested? So we understand now that winter wheat is the older. Winter wheat is Yoshon, so it could be used right away. And it's connected to Leah. So when is winter wheat harvested? It's harvested in the summer. So when in the summer? Well, let's have a look. In the summer, watch this. We've all been told through the church, because they line up with, with the Jews, that the 6th of Savan is what they call Shavuot, or Feast of Weeks, and what the church calls Pentecost. Because they believe it's seven regular count days, uh, weeks, and then the 50th day. So the church said, oh, there's our 50 to Pentecost. But as you're going to see, we're not even in summer yet, are we? We're not even in summer. How is wheat harvested before it's even ready to start cutting down? You see, there's no such thing as this possibly being the time of winter wheat harvest. So why, why is it counted as here? Something's, something's mixed up, right? Because I'm going to show you how the harvests of the earth play out. A literal picture. So clearly this is not Pentecost. Because not only is Pentecost after the seven Sabbaths and then 50 days, but those 50 days have to be at a time when the grapes are ready to harvest so that there's new wine. That doesn't happen in May. Let alone no wheat being ready in late May, let alone grapes. You see, there's not even spring wheat. There's not winter wheat. None of it's ready at this point. Something is off in what we've been told. And it's the count in the understanding and the wording that we need to grasp. This is why I was saying when we come to Deuteronomy, we read that with Passover and we have the bread of affliction, when we come down to Feasts of Weeks and we see that it's seven Sabbaths or seven weeks. And then what? From when you begin to put the sickle to the corn. Well, here's the thing. It's called corn. But as we saw, it's not necessarily corn. Right? It just says it's a type of grain. There was no corn 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years ago, even 1,000 years ago in Israel. You see? No, there was no corn in the ancient Middle East. Corn, also known as maize, is a New World crop. It originated in cent Central America and was introduced to the Old World after 1500 CE. So it was like 500 and some years ago. So this is telling us that in Deuteronomy, it's telling us of a grain. Well, what grain is it talking about? If it was supposed to be barley, why would it talk about when barley is being harvested? When, when barley was harvested and beginning its harvest, uh, all the way back in, in uh, you know late March or generally early April. Because what you're going to see and as you're starting to see, there is no wheat for bread with leaven that could possibly be brought in in late May or even early June. And what you come to see, and I believe this article even talks about it, <coughs> excuse me, is that, is that what the Jews would justify with is they would just use the spring wheat that was harvested in the last fall 
And then when it comes around to the following Passover second day, it then becomes what's called Yoshon, like this, like the winter wheat, meaning now it can be used. And so they take that wheat, and when they finish the seventh Sabbath, and at the 50th day, they grind up that wheat and they say, see, that's the one. But it's not true. It's not at all true. Because it says, from when you put the sickle to the corn, and you have those seven Sabbaths, when those seven Sabbaths are done, you're to make me some bread with leaven to bring into the temple, to bring into church. So they're using this spring wheat from the previous year, waiting till the following year, second day of Passover. And when Feast of Weeks comes, that's the one they're using. And they're saying, see, that's how you count it. It's not true. It's wrong. So let me show you. Watch this. Here's what's called Lamaste, or an easier thing, lo Loafmas Day. Okay? Loafmas Day has been happening all throughout Europe and all throughout those nations for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And they've settled on a date to observe it on August 1st. Okay? On August 1st is when they've settled it. Listen to what this says. Uh, where is it? The day when loaves baked from the first of the wheat harvest were blessed at church. When do they bring it in? August 1st. Well, of course, it has to be somewhere, give or take, around August. Because that is the winter wheat for the Feast of Weeks. And they baked the bread with the wheat harvest that they that they brought in. So they have, for hundreds of years, have had a set date of August 1st. It could be late July, mid-ish August. It's always in that range. And the only way to get there is when you begin to count, when you begin to count seven Sabbaths, from when you put the sickle to the corn. Well, there was no corn, so this grain would have to be some grain that stands up, yet barley is already done, so then it would have to be a count that begins from wheat. We know there was no corn. So let's see if we can prove this out. Loaves were baked. These are the loaves baked with leaven because it's the wheat harvest and they're brought into the church. Exactly as it said with Leviticus. Well, let's go read a little bit further. August begins, Loafmas Day, the day in the Book of Common Prayer calendar when a loaf baked with flour from newly harvested corn would be brought into the church and blessed. So is it corn or is it wheat? It's wheat. Because there was no corn before about 500 years ago. It is the Feast of Weeks. And the true count to the Feast of Weeks is from when the sickle is put to the wheat. And the sickle is not put to the wheat till generally around where they have the Feast of Weeks. It's generally in the first half of the third month, which is the month of Savan. So something has gone on, and we know that the calendars are off by two months from thousands of years ago based on the sun and the, and the, and the circuit of the sun that has gone off course by two months over thousands of years. But how can we track this then? Well, we can track it by actual harvests that take place on the earth. Actual harvests, events that have been taking place for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, proving to us when the wheat is ready. When the older is ready, it's ready in summer. 
the sickle is put to the corn slash the wheat. When the harvest is brought in, they smash it. They make flour. They bake it with leaven and loaves are brought into the churches as the Lord had, 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 uh, uh, had told them in the law to bring it into the temple. This is all about Leah pre-trip. The whole thing. So the question is, where does the count happen? Well, <clears throat> excuse me. If this is generally the time frame of when it when the sickle is put to the corn or to the wheat, then you would count out seven Sabbaths, right? Seven Sabbaths. And when we count out seven Sabbaths, we end up on true Sabbaths. One, two, three. Four, five, six, seven. It brings us to the eighth of Av. Now, I'm showing this in 2023, but you can just apply it to any year. It brings us to the eighth of Av. What is the eighth of Av? Well, look at that. Late July, right before August, when they would observe this bringing in of the wheat loaves, uh, uh, of, yeah, of the wheat loaves, with leaven that they would bake and bring into churches. You understand, it's impossible for it to be way back in late May, early June. There is no wheat that's been harvested from the sickle being put to be able to bake bread with two loaves with leaven. And the only way the Jews have justified it was by using new wheat Waiting till it turns Yosho on the second day the following year and using that when this count comes. But that is not what Scripture told them to do. That's not what Scripture said. Scripture said from when you put the sickle in, seven Sabbaths, and when that time comes, then you've done what? Then you're to bake two loaves, bring it in with leaven unto me. Are you tracking this? This is so important to be able to see and to be able to follow and understand. It's the actual time on the earth when wheat has finished its harvesting. It's generally very late July into early the first half of August. As it has been for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years being observed. Okay, so <clears throat> now what about spring wheat? Well, now we've just seen this, this picture of the, the Leia type that goes first at True Feast of Weeks, which is really connected to a count that's late July, early August. And when we do this count, we end up at the 8th of Av. It brings us to a count as the seventh Sabbath to the eighth of Av. Now, what does this reveal? For those that have been following the shorts, you'll hear me often refer to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I've only got one minute to catch new people's attention to help them see the prophetic understanding of what Paul is telling us in 2 Corinthians. And I get so many comments on people thinking I'm drunk, people thinking I'm nuts, because they're not seeing with the prophetic understanding, as Ecclesiastes 1 9 said, as Isaiah chapter 28, I think verse 9, uh, uh, chapter 28 said, you know, here a little, there a little, what was shall be, what is shall be. Paul is showing us a prophetic picture. It is those in Christ above 14 years who are going to go like a rapture to the third heaven. It is going to be a mid trib. Such a man, not those in Christ, but they, they believe in him. They're going in the mid-trib, great multitude rapture, in the was caught up. And then you have a picture of him saying, so he's like a picture of Christ. Behold, the third time I'm ready to come to you. So he's not bringing them any more burden. Now he's coming to them. This is a picture of pre-taking, mid-taking, post-return. Because they're all true. And when you understand the differences in the Gospels, you will come to see it. So where is this above? 
this above 14 years. That means there's a period of time before the 14 years of tribulation officially kick off. Will it start on the above? Yes, because at whatever this start of above is, that's the pre-trib, old wheat, Leia, winter wheat made into two loaves with leaven. This is the above. And on day one, right before this above begins, this group, the first one, Leia, pre-trib, Luke, is taken out. So what is this a picture of? What is this above? Well, after the last six years and doing all this research, we've known this now for a few years, this above represents 50 days. We even saw a glimpse of it <clears throat> by going into Leviticus and then coming into Deuteronomy 16 and seeing that there is no 50 days coming next. It's seven Sabbaths for the Feast of Weeks, and then there's something else going on that are the 50 days. So if we come to the 8th of Av, and it's right in the midst of the annual time when the winter wheat is used for bread with leaven to bring into the temple, if we then begin after the seventh Sabbath and begin to count, count 50 days, it brings us from the ninth of Av to the 29th of Elul. This would be the 50-day count to Pentecost. It, it, I know it sounds difficult for people to grasp, but the reason it sounds so difficult is because we've been so twisted in our understanding to believe that Feasts of Weeks and Pentecost are all the way back in late May or early June when there is no wheat to harvest and there are no grapes to harvest at all. Not even kind of at all. All you have to do is spend time seeking and searching these things out to understand greater revelation within them. So how does this timing now, what, it, what does this timing have to do with also the spring wheat? Okay, so now we've covered. Winter wheat is done. We know it's at the true Feast of Weeks count. It'll bring us, I believe, to the 8th of Av on the 7th Sabbath count when that wheat is ready, and we can show it by literal harvest seasons on the earth happening at that time every year, still now. Still now, you see? Still now. And for hundreds of years have been happening. So what does this do now with spring wheat? Well, spring wheat is harvested in the fall. What else is harvested in the fall? Grapes. I just showed you now that a 50-day count brings you to the 29th of Elul, which is anywhere generally around mid-September into the earlier portion of October. So let's see if we can understand anything from this. Let's go to Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, 50 days is Pentecost, right? It's not Feast of Weeks. When, when scriptures talk about Passover, it says Passover, just like the Old Testament. The New Testament will tell you it's Passover. When it's tabernacles, it tells you tabernacles. In the New Testament, it refers back. Why does Acts chapter 2 tell you Pentecost instead of telling you Feast of Weeks? Because it's not Feast of Weeks. It's the 50 days that come after true Feast of Weeks. And what happened at Pentecost, 50 days after true Feast of Weeks? It was the time of new wine. They were being accused of being drunken on new wine. So when is new wine? If it ends up that the last day of the Hebrew year before Tishri is Elul 29, and it ends up anywhere from mid-September uh, uh, mid generally to maybe early October, do you think maybe this time frame is where new wine and harvested wine should happen? Well, let's have a look and see. 
The harvest season typically falls between August and October in the Northern Hemisphere. Grape harvest. When the grapes are ready and the grape harvest happens, it would be late August, but not generally very often. But through September is the main portion generally, even into the earlier portion of October. Well, isn't that fascinating? In the middle of, August, of September this year is right in the midst of the period where actual grapes are being harvested. And I showed you that to be an exact count from when winter wheat was harvested after seven Sabbaths. There's a reason. These things make sense. And just as they've been doing this for hundreds and hundreds of years, and it still happens at this time because that's where the harvests are, they've been doing it for hundreds and hundreds of years with grapes too. This Worcester mark or sausage market is in uh it's in Germany. It's held annually on the second to the third second to the third weekend of September, and it's being held since 1417. 600,000 visitors a year go to what? The wine festival. The largest wine festival in the world. And when does it happen? Generally right in here. Why? Because this is the time of the grape harvest. I, you see, I've often wondered, churches must know. There's got to be some pastors that know some of this. But because of committees and boards and everything else, <clears throat> excuse me, they're not allowed to talk about it. And But do I think that's majority of the case? No. I think very few really take the time to dig in because they're just so busy with their church things. They were full being accused of being full of new wine. This is new wine season. And it was exactly 50 days from the Feast of Weeks with, with leaven to be brought in from wheat. What else happens at this time? The spring wheat. This is also the time of spring wheat. When spring wheat is planted, and it's the new, it's the Rachel, it's also being harvested at this time as well. But you got to remember, it doesn't mean everything's happening back to back and, and all of tribulation is going to be one year. Remember how long he worked for Rachel? He had to work that additional six years, uh, sorry, seven years of the 14 he had to work one of those seven years for Rachel. You see, he had to put in another seven years for Rachel. But where is the Rachel harvest? It's in the fall. It's at the same time as the grapes. So you have the grape harvest that goes from generally here, even to early October, just depending on the year and how the season has gone. And then you've got wheat, which happens in the fall, not generally earlier, but generally goes in, whoops, generally goes into here. So, so the grape harvest is ready, is a little bit before the spring wheat is harvested in the fall. Okay. So you had grapes starting up here, going into early October. And then you have spring wheat, which is harvested generally late September into the early portion of October. So you have the grapes a little bit before the spring wheat. Why is that important? Well, there's two things going on. One is to understand that true Pentecost is actually before the Feast of Trumpets. Sounds crazy, right? Sounds all twisted from everything we've ever been taught. But I'm showing you the actual evidence for hundreds of years happening across the earth. All throughout the Northern Hemisphere, including Israel. All of it. OK, 
Okay, so this is to show you that true Pentecost, which is 50 days later from the Feast of Weeks, at true Feast of Weeks, is the time when the grapes come in, which is the time of new wine. Okay, so now what we're seeing here is we've come to Pentecost. If what we saw in 2 Corinthians, the above is starts with the pre-trib and this above is the 50 days, that means on the 50th day of this above is the anointing of what we call Acts 2.0, the anointing of the Holy Ghost before the 14 years of tribulation of seals and trumpets begin. Well, we just saw that the start right before the 50 is the pre-trib, winter wheat, feasts of weeks, 50 days later is true Pentecost, new wine. Okay, is it is it also um, a connection to Rachel? No, because Rachel's not the wine. Rachel's the spring wheat. It just so happens that spring wheat and wine are ready and harvested right around the same time with grapes being a little bit sooner. So as we follow this forward and we know that he put in an additional seven years for Rachel, let me show you this chart again. We've now gone from the pre-trib escape, then the 50 days to true Pentecost, right at the end of 50 days, and then at trumpets, the first seven of the 14 years begin. Who is this period of seven years for? What's the picture? Rachel. Rachel. So at in the seventh year time frame, we should see a picture in a period of time connected to Rachel. Okay? Connected to, to the was caught up portion of Rachel. This is what we're talking about. So we know there's grapes a little bit first, grapes a little bit first, and then Rachel. Okay? So let's take this forward. We see this now with the spring wheat, and look what happens when we go into the book of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 6, as, as you've gone through or as you go through teachings here in the ministry, you'll understand that within those 50 days, it is the pre-trib bride of Christ taken out, the Luke type, the Leia type. There's the seven-day Leia Gentile wedding that takes place. The Lord will return because he is the white horse rider who will be here for 40 days, starting from the eighth day, adding 40. It takes you to the 47th day. When his 40 days are done, he leaves, and then there's three more days to true Pentecost at the 29th of Elul. And when the Holy Ghost gives that anointing, the Holy Ghost is now gone. And we read at the, at the Red Horse Rider that now peace is taken from the earth. Because the 14 years begin at the Red Horse Rider, which is nation against nation. You see that now they're going to kill one another and a great sword is given. It is the red horse rider timing that is the beginning of the 14 years. And it will begin at the Feast of Trumpets. And when this begins at the red horse rider, Feast of Trumpets, in the year that this will take place, which I personally believe through revelation of Scripture will be next year, at the Feast of Trumpets, the 14 years begin. <laughs> Excuse me. At the end of the sixth seal, which will equal the end of six years. We see the Lord coming. This is the Lord coming for with Mount Zion. He's coming to get 2 Corinthians chapter 12, the great multitude rapture. Who is that? That's the Rachel type. It's the other weed harvest, but only six years have passed, right? Why, why is it only six years and not seven? Well, the event will happen in the seventh. It's not going to happen in the sixth. Six years will come to an end. 
when the six years come to an end, in the seventh year, he's going to get his Rachel. Just like he served seven more years. Remember, prophetic pictures, typologies are here a little, there a little. They give us a prophetic picture, but not every little detail. So it was six years and six months and then six more months for this. And No, it gives you a prophetic picture. It gives you insight into seven and seven and six, okay? Which is a prophetic picture of seven easy. He gets the pre-trip, then seven of seals, gets Rachel, then six years of trumpets, returns on Mount of Olives, and then has the final year to fulfill after he renews his covenant. So here we are at the end of the sixth year of seals, and he's coming on heavenly Mount Zion, the place prepared for them. Okay, he went to prepare a place for them for for his Rachel. And now he's coming to get his Rachel. Well, look what happens. You go to Revelation chapter seven. And look at what we have. <clears throat> Excuse me. We have a group of the hundred and forty four thousand. That are being sealed first. Before the great multitude rapture, Rachel. Why does this matter? Because I just showed you the way it happens on the earth and actually happens prophetically, the grapes. The grape harvest has come in just a little bit before. There's an overlap, <coughs> excuse me, to when the wheat of the spring wheat is harvested and brought in. So what I'm telling you is the 144,000 are a prophetic picture of a group that are going to work after the seals are done, but they're sealed at the time of the grape harvest right before the wheat harvest, the spring wheat harvest. But now remember what Deuteronomy said in chapter 16. We've fulfilled at the pre-trib at the pre-trib Luke Leia typology, old wheat, the pre-trib has been fulfilled in the Feast of Weeks. Then you've got what? Passover and unleavened bread. Unleavened bread is called the bread of affliction. It's seven days as a picture of seven years in the typology. And how does it play out? Six days as six years, like the six years of seals. And then what happens in the seventh? In the seventh year or in the seventh day, it's a solemn assembly to the Lord God. So what ends up happening in the prophetic picture? <clears throat> when the sixth year of seals is done, in the seventh year is the time uh, uh, of an assembly to the Lord. And how does it start? It begins the seventh year with the grape harvest, with, with a, a grape group represented as the 144,000 being sealed, followed by the great multitude rapture, who is the new one that he had to work seven more years for, who is the spring wheat, Rachel. And if she is the spring wheat and it's connected to unleavened bread, like six years, the bread of affliction, and the seventh is a holy assembly unto the Lord, then sometime in this seventh year, the great multitude rapture of Rachel comes in. Well, we know that she's harvested in the fall. When the six years of seals are done, there's the grape harvest, the sealing of the 144. And now Rachel, the, the story of Rachel being brought in of the great multitude rapture is happening. But the observing of her time, the observing of the new, of the younger, of the spring wheat Rachel cannot happen until the following year on 
the second day of Passover, which is what? Unleavened bread. You see, Jesus came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The lost sheep of the house of Israel is a prophetic picture of the, the 10 tribes and the Gentiles grafted in that we call the world. They say they're lost tribes. They can't find them because they're so mingled in with everybody around the world. This is the great multitude rapture in the seventh year of seals on the second day of unleavened bread. Do you follow what's going on here? Connected to unleavened bread, Jesus was the one connected to the feast of first fruits and unleavened bread. Jesus came for what? The lost. The lost sheep of the house of Israel. This is the main group he's coming to save. Because it's the Rachel. It's the Rachel picture. The ones who went first, they were the more loyal. They were the loyal Leahs. Less pretty, less beautiful, but they were the most loyal. They didn't need any special thing to come against them. They were loyal. They were the what? Watching, praying, and diligently seeking him. He doesn't need to come and save those guys. Are they going to be saved? Yes, they're spirit-filled. They're going to go before anything happens. But this is the group of his Rachel that he wanted. And it even plays out as six days. And then the seventh, whoops, and then the seventh is the, uh, all, uh, the solemn assembly to the Lord. It's the exact picture of the great multitude rapture that comes in after the wine, the 144 seal. You following? And when you look at the chart, if it plays out that 2023, 2024, meaning 50 days before in 2024, let me just... I'm going longer than I had anticipated, but let me just put this out there for you. What this means to me in the revelation of it all is I believe most likely the pre-trib bride of Christ will be gone at the ninth of uh, at the eighth of Av, somewhere around the eighth of Av in August of 2024. The 50 days begin on the ninth of Av, and there's many other things connected to this time, and it will go to the 29th of Elul, new wine. When that 50-day anointing happens, bang, the 14 years begin at trumpets. Okay, that's what you're seeing right here. There's your 50 days in this final seventh year. Then after the 50th day at the Red Horse Rider, Feast of Trumpets 2024, the 14 years begin. This is now him putting in his time for Rachel. She is spring wheat. I, I want you to grasp the importance of why I'm showing you Revelation 7. You have a period of grapes that are harvested just before spring wheat. There's the grapes. There's your spring wheat starting to come in. But won't be fully observed until about six months later on the second day of Passover. That is the prophecy and the prophetic timing of spring wheat. And there are three feasts to the Lord. Three feasts to the Lord. <clears throat> and the first one is the middle one. Then it's the seven years of unleavened bread as days, as years. And then it's the seven years of tabernacles, days, as years. And then the great eighth day is what? A picture of the final jubilee. So you had what? Six days as six years. In that seventh year is the solemn assembly when it comes to unleavened bread, the solemn assembly to the Lord. Then you have seven years or seven days of tabernacles. There is no solemn assembly in this final 14th year. It's the day 
which is the year of the Lord's vengeance. And then the eighth day or the eighth year of tabernacles or the, the eighth day of tabernacles, which is a picture of the eighth year of trumpets, is the new beginning. The final jubilee. There are three feasts to the Lord. Feast of weeks, unleavened bread, and at the end of tabernacles, the final jubilee, new beginning of the eighth day. It's beautiful. It is an absolute prophetic picture in the three feasts to the Lord. Now, you're going to say, well, how do you know? How do you know that grapes has anything to do with the 144,000? Well, let me show you this. Actually, you know what? Let me show you another prophetic picture before I bring it to the end with that. We showed this picture, right, with Leah and Rachel. Seven easy years for Leah, okay? That's connected to the pre-trib. They flew by like days. There was no tribulation. It was easy. It was so in love. And then it's the seven years for Rachel, which are the seven years of seals. Then six of cattle. I showed you that these 20 years is a picture just like this. It's This is the big picture of 20. And in the prophetic end of days, this is the picture of it as 13, but the seven easy are done with. Okay? So what are we seeing? 13 and then one. Or in the bigger picture, 20 and then one. So what does he do? At the end of 20 years, which means at the beginning of the 21st year, or at the end of 13, the start of the 14th, so it could even be like right on this line. He makes a covenant. So let me show you this prophetic picture just in one place to give you this understanding. You see, in Genesis chapter 16, Abraham ends up having Ishmael, which he shouldn't have, who's called a wild man. Everybody's against him and him against everybody. Those are the Arabs, of course, and that's why there's never any silence or any peace over there, okay? He's the wild man. They represent the wild man. But how old was Abraham? He was 86 years old. Who is Ishmael a picture of? The Arabs, the Antichrist. There he is right there at the beginning. And then you go to 17, and now Abraham is 99 years old, which is 13 years later. And Ishmael is now 13 years old, okay? So what are we getting a picture of? There's your start of tribulations, okay? The time of Arabs. Antichrist is 100% going to be Arab. Don't ever doubt it. And there's your picture of 13 years. Well, the picture of 13, remember, was also the picture of the 20 in the big picture, okay? With the easy years still in it. So there's your... 13 years or 20. And when it's over, you go to chapter 21, or uh, sorry, in 17, when Abraham is 99 and Ishmael is now 13, what does God do? He makes a covenant between them. What happened with Ishmael after the 20 years? He made a covenant with his father in law. There's your big picture 20, makes a covenant. There's your prophetic picture, end of days, 13, and then makes a covenant. Well, let me show you something else this does. If you go right across here, <clears throat> these are books that we call chapters to years. You're going to notice something very interesting, and it's a prophetic insight. In the four Gospels, you have the synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They stand on their own. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they're called synoptic. And then John stands all by himself. And you know what's interesting about it? In the resurrection story of Luke, Mark, and Matthew which, with Christ, they all happen in the final chapter of Luke, Mark, and Matthew. But in John's gospel, Jesus' resurrection doesn't happen in chapter 21. It happens in, wouldn't you know it, chapter 20. It happens in chapter 20. Do you know why? Because John's book is a prophetic picture of this same timeline within seven easy 
and then the 14 years. See, what is Christ doing? It's a picture of him coming like right at the end of that 20 to the start of 21. Just like after 13 years, the Lord makes a covenant with Abraham. And then bang, the Lord shows up, the promise. And then what does he do? In the story of Jacob, works 20. And after those 20, bang, right on this line, the start of 21, bang, he makes a covenant. That's a prophetic picture. Christ's death and resurrection, bang, there's his resurrection, chapter 20. It's the exact same prophetic picture. Over and over and over again. And, and why does this matter? What is this also showing us? Well, I'm showing you these timings all throughout Scripture, showing you that it's 20 and then bang, covenant for the 21st. Then I'm showing you it's 13 years and then bang, the 14th. He makes a covenant and bang, the start of the 14th, the Lord's there. Over and over and over and over again. It's a beautiful prophetic picture. But now what happens in this final year? Remember, we're talking about grapes, right? We're talking about grapes, which means the time of grapes, this is when the grapes got sealed. The, pic the prophetic picture of the time of grapes connected to the 144 is right here, which is like John chapter 14. What do we see in John chapter 14? We see the prophetic picture of the great multitude. He says, I go and prepare a place for you that when I return... I will receive you to myself that where I am there, you may be also. And what happens in the seventh year of seals? The Lord has come on heavenly Mount Zion, as 2 Corinthians chapter 12 said, for that great multitude that was caught up, they're the ones going to paradise where they're going to have their places prepared for them. It's incredible. So we have the grapes group sealed, and then you have the great multitude rapture. So that means we're now talking trumpets is a picture of a period of time of grapes. This was winter wheat. Whoops. This was the connection to winter wheat in, in this grouping right here. This is the connection to spring wheat that takes you to uh, unleavened bread. And then you've got now all this story, which is in grapes. And it starts with the sealing of grapes in the seventh year. And what happens when the story of seven years of trumpets tribulation begins? It's going to start with a period of time of grapes. Watch this. Let's go to John <clears throat> chapter 15 in the, in the prophetic picture in the typology of chapters to years. And look at what it says, John 15, 1. I am the true vine. The vine. What grows on vine? grapes right and my father is the husbandman every branch in me that beareth not fruit he taketh away and every branch that bears fruit he purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit it's all about vines and fruit and a group of workers a group you can say of his disciples here and it's all see of his disciples it's this prophetic picture in the is to come, as Ecclesiastes 1.9 said, I've showed you some in the was that are showing the shall be, and I'm showing you some in the is that are also shall be. This is a prophetic picture as well in typology of a group that he's now talking to that are going to be called his friends. This is a picture of the 144,000, as Revelation 14 says, they are now on Mount Zion with them. They have the Father's name written on them. And here's Jesus with them. Starting trumpets. He came on heavenly Mount Zion. And this group is the group sealed as the 144 who are about to go out and do this work as the 144,000 during trumpets. And they're to go and produce fruit from him, which is the vine. It's a prophetic picture in the typology of grapes. Now watch this. If we go to <clears throat> Jeremiah 25, as I bring this to an end, in Jeremiah 25, this is something for those that have followed for a while. We've covered this quite a bit lately because it was an awesome revelation. We see 
in Jeremiah 25, verse 12. And it shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished that I will uh, punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity and for uh, and the land of the Chaldees, and I will make it perpetual desolations. You see, if the Lord is bringing destruction and devastation against all the enemies of Israel here and of the world, you see, for many nations and great kings shall serve themselves of them until the wine, until the Lord what? Brings the cup of the wine of his fury. You see, he's going to make all nations to drink of it. Well, do you realize that's not how tribulation starts? The Lord isn't coming to destroy all the enemies of Israel at the beginning of tribulation. It's going to be the enemies of Israel being victorious, thinking they're victorious, but destroying the enemies of the Lord, uh, uh, the, 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 those saved in the Lord. It's tribulation against the church. It's tribulation against the Jews. You see, for that remnant, that Rachel part that was left. Because, remember, Rachel wasn't the best one, remember? Leah was the loyal, obedient one. Rachel wasn't. Rachel did some defiling things. Remember, and even, and even took the idol, hid it under herself. You see, during a time of what? The Antichrist and the image, the idol. This is now when the Lord says, now I'm bringing the sword and I'm coming to destroy all the nations. And he's telling them it's going to be the wine of his wrath. He's going to have them all to drink of the wine. You see, drink ye and be drunk because of the sword, which I will send among you. You see, and I will bring evil on the city, which is called by my name. And you think you're going to be utterly unpunished? Look at what he then says in verse 30. Therefore prophesy against them um, all these words and say unto them, The Lord shall roar from on high and utter his voice from his holy habitation. He shall roar, roar mightily upon his habitation. He shall give a shout as they that tread the grapes against all the inhabitants of the earth. He will plead with all flesh, and look, they're going to be left unburied from one end of earth unto the other. Do you realize the treading of the grapes and all of the destructions of the enemies of God doesn't happen until when? The day of the Lord, which is the year of his wrath. Go read Isaiah 61, verse 2. And there's other places as well. This is the time of the treading of the grapes. So to understand this, if we go to Revelation chapter 19, this is what we see. <clears throat> Revelation 19, the white horse comes to make war. This is at the end of 13. Remember, this is the picture of the end of 13 or the end of the big picture of 20. He's coming to renew the covenant that he made. And what does he do? Remember, he said he's bringing a sword. He's coming to bring war, make war against them. Here he is. There's his sharp sword that he will smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. When does this take place? Jeremiah said, after 70 years are complete. <clears throat> Those were 70 years in Babylon. But what is the prophetic typology? The prophetic typology is right here. When Israel finally captured both sides of Jerusalem, when they had all of Jerusalem in 1967, 1967, 1968, year one. <clears throat> when does it end? Check it out. In the prophetic understanding if the seventh year, we're now in from Feast of Trumpets, we're now in that final, <coughs> excuse me, don't, don't, this is another 70, don't count this one. We're now in this count right here from when they captured Jerusalem. This is Feast of Trumpets, 2024, begins year one, and there's your sixth to your seventh year of Rachel. <clears throat> you had the, the grapes that now begin, the grapes begin to what? 
to the end of 13 years or the big picture, this would be 20 with the seven easy. And what is 2037? The 70th year complete from when they captured Jerusalem. It literally equals the end of 13 years. What was the picture? Abraham, Ishmael. And at the end of 13, then on the 14th year, when Abraham is now 100 in Genesis 31, uh, uh, sorry, in Genesis 21, he's now 100, <clears throat> excuse me, and the Lord shows up. What is this final seventh year? It's the day of the Lord and the year of his wrath. It is the treading of the grapes of all the enemies of the Lord, like Zechariah 14, that take place after 70 years are complete in the prophetic typology of Jeremiah chapter 25. It even said, now they're going to drink of the wine of the grapes of the wrath of the Lord. <clears throat> when is the time of grapes? You got it. September into early October, the time of new wine, when the Lord comes what? As Matthew 24 said, so when 13 years are done, <clears throat> it'll end at the time of new wine and it'll be the treading of the grapes at the Feast of Trumpets for the final year of the Lord, which will begin in 2037 at the time of trumpets. Like Matthew 24 said, the day and hour no one knows, which is the Feast of Trumpets to begin the 14th year after the 13th year is done. Do you see how that all ties together? Grapes. Grapes. Not only is it the time at the end of six years of seals and that seventh year, which is the time to be brought into the Lord in the, in the sixth to the seventh with unleavened bread as days to years, it showed us it was the time of Pentecost and then the sixth to the seventh year starting. And when those years are over, it'll be the time of new wine, which is time of Pentecost, the time of grapes. And then the remainder or the bringing in of the great multitude rapture of the new wheat in the seventh year of seals. And then when trumpets begins, we know it's the start also of this time because he is the vine and there to go produce fruit. And when the six years of, of, of trumpets is over and it's the end of 13 years, it'll be the time of grapes, which is the time of Pentecost. And he comes, as Matthew said, on the day and hour that no one knows to begin that 14th year, which is the year, which is the day of the Lord when he's going to what? Tread the grapes of the great winepress of the wrath of Almighty God. Brothers and sisters, the prophetic picture and the timing of pre, mid, and post is all about winter wheat, pre-trib, Luke, Leah, Gentile bride of Christ, at the true feasts of weeks, true harvest time complete of the winter wheat in summer. Then, 50 days to Pentecost, and then the start of the 14 years of tribulation. Then in the seventh year of seals, at the end of six to start seven, at the time of grapes, the 144,000 who are his grape workers are sealed. And then you have the spring wheat, the spring wheat Rachel group brought in, but not observed until the second day of unleavened bread in the middle approximately of the seventh year of seals, the spring wheat harvest. And when trumpet starts, it is now the Lord there as the vine with those who are to bring in fruit because they are connected to the time of grapes and the connection, which is the time of trumpets where seals was wheat, spring wheat. And now trumpets 
is the grapes. And there are the grape workers going out in the time of trumpets. And at the end of trumpets, at the end of 13 years or the six years of trumpets, it becomes the day of the Lord, which is the year of his wrath and the time of making them all drink the wine when he comes at the time of wine on the day and hour no one knows of Matthew 24, <clears throat> excuse me, to fulfill that final year and the treading of the grapes. <laughs> it is so perfectly beautiful. It's all about the two wheat harvests and the grapes harvest and their times of the end of days. It is a prophetic timing of pre, mid, and post. I hope you can see it. Please take the time to dig into these things. Search these things out for yourselves. Understand them and draw closer. Pray over them and watch the intro series if you're new to this ministry. I promise you all of these things will be worth your time and you will understand the timing of pre, mid, and post directly connected to Luke's discourse, Mark's discourse, and Matthew's discourse all in order. It's simply a matter of, Lord, what year will this all begin in? And according to Jerusalem and the prophetic typology of 70 for Jerusalem, look at this timing. Look at this timing. The end of 70 and the treading of the grapes year. That seventh year of the seven days of tabernacles. And it is not till the eighth day, which is the new beginning, which is a picture of the eighth year from the start of trumpets. And that is the final Jubilee picture. God is good, brothers and sisters. The spirit is absolutely leading. And as much as this ended up being oh, at least twice as long as what I wanted, I pray it blesses you. I pray you share it. I pray you spend time digging into it, understanding it so that you could share it with others and know the seasons and times in the prophetic revelation of their seasons and times on the earth. I love you guys. God bless you. God bless your families. We'll talk to you soon. Bye for now.